in today's video we're going to have a look at another drafting and interpreting financial statements question. So I've prepared a question on screen here that we're going to go through. So you could use this video as a bit of a revision Q&A, maybe pause this where you need to and go back. And on top of that, if you join my community online, which is Miss Finance Tutorials on Podia, you can actually download this spreadsheet and have a go yourself. So let's jump into it. Okay, so what we've got on screen here is a draft trial balance. So here we're given some figures in column C and D, which is what we've got to work with initially. So we've got all of our balance sheet items, all of our income statement items, and we're being told that the year end is the 30th of September. So this is the type of question that you're going to face in your exam where you're given draft numbers. Then you're going to be asked to post journals, so effectively like year end journals, and that's going to give you a final trial balance. Um, figure, which we're then going to prepare um, an income statement and a balance sheet off the back of. So down here, we're being given some further information. So if I was doing this again, um, I wouldn't go back and spend too long on looking at the figures. I would jump straight to what they're asking you because that'll just save some time in the long run. So let's start with closing inventory. So we're being told that closing inventory balance at the year end is £180,000. But when we look at the TB, and this is something to pay close attention to, you can see that that's rounded to thousands. So where it says 180,000 for the closing stock, actually we only want to write 180 um, in that because of these um, roundings, so don't get caught out by that. So we've got inventory at the minute sat on the balance sheet of 160,000. So we want to increase that to 180. So we're only going to be posting 20 as in 180 minus 160. So that will give us a final balance sheet item of 180,000 um, of stock. So then the other side of that is going to go to the income statement in cost of sales. Um, so that is going to be a credit. So what we're doing there um, is basically we're taking out stock that we've purchased in the year that sat in the cost of sales and we're moving that to the balance sheet because that is stock that we've got at the year end. So if we look at the double entry here, I'm just going to move my cuppa over there, we're going to have um, a debit to inventory on the balance sheet and we're going to have a credit to inventory in the P&L. And again, this is where we're increasing stock at year end. So if we were decreasing stock at year end, it would be the other way around. So I always used to find that it was easier to remember what happened on the balance sheet first and then adjust for the other side of the income statement where necessary. Next, we've been told that we've got a corporation tax charge of 183,882. Um, so here, when we're preparing a set of year end um, financial statements, we don't know what the corporation tax is going to be until we've prepared um, the final figures effectively. So you're never going to find, or in very, very rare circumstances in reality, that a company has paid corporation tax in the year. Um, so we're always technically going to have a provision for that on the balance sheet. And in very, very rare circumstances, we don't. Because if that was to happen, it would mean that that company has been paying towards the corporation tax in the year without knowing what the final corporation tax is going to be. And that's not really how it works as such. And that's not really that beneficial from a cash point of view for a company. So what you're going to see in your exam is that you've got a corporation tax P&L item, so a debit, and then you're going to have a corporation tax provision for the amount due to HMRC as a credit on the balance sheet. So that there is going to be a debit, I feel like I'm losing my voice, um, and a credit to corporation tax on the balance sheet. And again, because we're doing rounding to um, the nearest thousand, that's only going to be that divided by a thousand. And that's going to be there. Okay. Now, the one thing to make sure that you are taking note of as you're going through and you're making these adjustments is that your adjustment column down here is adding up. So you've got 203.88 and 203.88 in debits and credits at the minute. And we want to make sure that that's always the case because otherwise we're going to get to the end and realise that our trial balance doesn't balance. So again, save your time. Just make sure that it balances as we're posting these journals. Um, next, depreciation is calculated at 25% straight line. So that's super easy. All we need to do is take... Um, our plant and equipment costs because there doesn't seem to be any other non-fixed um, 
non-current assets even. So if we did that times by 0.25, that's going to give us 425. So with depreciation, that's going to be an expense in the income statement. And the other side, credit is going to be against accumulated depreciation on the balance sheet. And the main reason that we actually post depreciation is because we're spreading the cost of that asset over its useful life. So if we looked at this from um, a company's point of view and we looked on the balance sheet, you're going to see that they've got an asset sat there. But we need to post accumulated depreciation against that asset as time goes on. Because where with this example, we've got 1.7 million pounds of plants and equipment. When that was purchased, however many years ago, it's not going to be worth the same today. So we're effectively reducing the net book value of that asset held on the balance sheet because of things like wear, tear, time, etc. So what we're going to post here is a debit to depreciation on the income statement. And then down here, a credit to accumulated depreciation. And when I was studying, the only way that I could decipher between what was on the balance sheet and on the income statement was that accumulated depreciation on the balance sheet has accumulated in the title. So that's a bit of a, a giveaway. There we go. Okay, so next we've got bad debt provision 1% of total debtors. Okay, so our trade debtors is just up here. So 1% of that is going to be 5.25. So here, at the minute, we've actually got a bad debt provision in there already. So that's saying we've got a bad debt provision of £300,000. So because that's a lot more than what our bad debt provision should be, we need to adjust for that. And this is going to look a bit odd because we're actually reducing the total bad debt provision instead of increasing it. And a lot of the time in the exam, if you're getting given um, a question around the bad debt provision, you're usually increasing it. So you might not have seen a decrease yet. But all we're going to do is take 300 minus 5.25. And that's then going to reduce our total bad debt provision to 5.25 or 5,250. So what we're doing there is we are actually debiting the bad debt provision on the balance sheet to decrease it. And therefore, we're going to have a credit to the income statement for this bad debt provision decrease of the 294.75. Um, there we go. So where you've got expenditure on the income statement, this bad debt provision is actually going to increase net profit and not decrease it because of the fact that it's a credit to the income statement, just like sales is a credit to the income statement. So we've dealt with all of these here. And next we've been told that we've got insurance costs um, relating to insurance taken out over 12 months. So when you're going through an exam question like this, just know that there's only so many year end journals that they can ask you to post. So things like prepayments, accruals, depreciation, amortization, bad debt, bad debt provisions, um, yeah, closing stock. Um, so once you get familiar with those type of year end journals, you're going to be okay with this type of exam question because again, there's only so much that they can ask you. So if we go to insurance, we've got 500,000 here. So we've got a prepayment there for and to work that out, we're going to do 500. So if that's from the 1st of April and our year end is September, we've already used April, May, June, July, August, September. So six months of that. So therefore we're prepaid six months. So if we divide that by 12 and times by six, that's going to give us a prepayment of 250,000. So equally, we're going to credit insurance that with 250,000. So Again, debit prepayments on the balance sheet and credit insurance on the P&L. So also, if we look here, sometimes um, people get a bit confused with prepayment cost items and, and how that kind of affects um, the income statement and the net profit, the bottom line. But just think of it this way, that if you've got costs, say if there's 500,000 that's sat in the income statement right now, and then you take some of that off, to then move it into the balance sheet up here, then that means that the total cost held for insurance in the income statement is a lot less. 
So if it's a lot less, then that means that net profit is going to be better because of the prepayment effectively. So we've dealt with that. And then we've not yet received the legal fees in association with bad debt recovery, which were 15,000. So legal fees here are gonna be 15. So that is a debit to legal fees because we're going to increase the total legal fees that we've got sat on the income statement. And then we need an accrual. Now, the reason why this is an accrual and not a trade creditor, um, for example, is because we're being told that we don't have the invoice yet. So if we don't have the invoice yet, it's not on trade creditors at year end. So the only other way to adjust for that is to put it as an accrual cost at year end. So credit accruals on the balance sheet. And that is that. So next, we need to actually prepare the year end financial statements. So let's just go down here and identify really quickly which one of these items are balance sheet and income. So we're going to put IS for income statement and um, SFP for statement of financial position just to keep them separate. Um, so admin, and again, you might want to just um, pause the video at this point in time and just see if you can go down this yourself. So uh, let's do statement of financial position items first, because again, I was always taught to start from the balance sheet. So share premium, uh, plant and equipment, accumulated, retained earnings, inventory, trade payables, prepayments, bad debt provision, accrual, share premium, balance sheet, and dividends paid. So dividends paid is going to be sat underneath retained earnings um, in the equity section of the balance sheet. You're not gonna see it on the income statement here. So that means that this is income statement, income statement, income statement, income statement, income statement, income statement. So that's grand. So then let's have a look at how this is going to look in an actual income statement and why. So this was our draft um, income statement. So we've got sales minus our cost of sales, given us gross profit, taking off our admin expenditure, depreciation, etc., and then getting us to net profit. Now I've just realized as well that actually the corporation tax adjustment that is there, that's not quite right. And that should actually be 203.784.5. And it was stated there, so missed that. However, that's now showing in there, which is correct. So um, we've now got here an inventory PL item, and you'll see that that is a positive figure just there because of this adjustment just here. So overall, we've got total cost of sales of 1093.4 thousand, um, because again, these are thousands, so maybe I should put that on there for you. Um, you'll see there that the bad debt provision um, expense is actually the other way around because, again, that we were decreasing the total bad debt provision that we had. Um, depreciation, insurance, legal fees, all costs. And then, obviously, our corporation tax um, estimate is a expense item in here too. So, where we've got net profit, that is the gross profit minus total admin and then we're taking off our corporation tax to get to our net profit after tax. So with all of that in mind, let's have a look at what a balance sheet or statement of financial position looks like. So these are our draft figures again, down here. And I'm gonna shoot all the way down to here because one thing that students tend um, to do quite a bit, um, and it's something that I did specifically when I was um, studying AAT, was I forgot that when I was preparing a statement of financial position that my retained earnings final um, balance carried forward would be different. So what you want to make sure is that retained earnings is all of your um, profit brought forward and it's stated there as a line item. So that's not going to change, but you want to be adding in this year's current earnings on top of that, because obviously next year, when you look at the balance sheet, the retained earnings figure is going to be all of the retaining earnings um, figures brought forward plus last year's profit or loss. So don't miss that out. And that there you can see is that figure there and there. 
and our equity items down here um, are usually a credit. So we've got dividends paid there, which is a debit, and that's the only um, sort of anomaly here, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and then, yeah, we've got our plant and equipment, um, accumulated depreciation, total non-current assets. So it should be on your balance sheet, non-current assets, current assets, current liabilities, non-current liabilities, equity, and laid out exactly like that. So we've got all of our cash at bank, our bad debt provision, which is a negative um, in the current um, assets, trade payables, accruals, corporation tax provision, um, total assets minus current liabilities, which is your non-current, current, current um, non-current, current again um, for assets and liabilities. And then what we should find if we've done this correctly is that our total equity, which we should probably add that there, should equal all of the assets minus all of the liabilities. So our accounting equation where we stated equity equals assets minus liabilities um, should be correct. And that way you know you've done it. So if you liked today's video, then give the video a thumbs up. Consider subscribing as always. And once again, if you want to join my free community on Podia, there is a link below in the description where you can download this Excel and give the question a go yourself. But otherwise, take care and I'll catch you on the next video.